Well, good evening. It's good to see everyone here tonight. Um, if you will turn your sermon outline over, you will notice that this evening we're going to be asking a question. And that question is, what will we know one second after we die? Um, just by coincidence, I had planned to preach this um, sermon this week, but I think on Wednesday night we pretty much covered Luke 16. <laughs> we, we did a good job on it, we had some great discussion on it, and I don't want to do anything to lessen that discussion, but I want to look at a few different aspects tonight um, of this passage, great passage. Um, I will say, and I believe Brother Leland made this uh, comment, th this is not a parable, brethren. This is not a parable. I, I know there's a lot of people who call it a parable, but there is nothing that is parabolic in it. The, it has mentioned real people, it mentions real events, and it talks about a real outcome. So, And it addresses things that are going to happen after we die as being factual, not a story. So um, we really get a good glimpse here of what life after death is going to be. And that's a little odd for us. We think you live and then you die and that's it. But there is life after we die physically. There's that spiritual existence that we will go into. So what happens? What happens after we die? There's a wonderful little book. It's written by, I believe his name is Michael Orr. Um, he wrote it through Start to Finish Publishers, which are, um, they write good material for Churches of Christ. And it's called, I Died Last Night. It, I, I, I'll try to order some. It's a little book. You can read it probably in about 15 minutes. And it is a book that is based on um, Luke chapter 16. And what it does is it, this person gives a, a, of course this is fiction, the person gives an account of what happened to them um, after they died and what they experienced and it puts it in some contemporary terms. It's a really interesting book. I think I have one copy downstairs if anybody's interested in reading it. Um, but it highlights the importance of what Jesus says here in Luke chapter 16. Um, this is a huge theological point that's presented to us. There, is, there are grand themes all throughout the Old and New Testament. I mean, things that are really important, things that we really gravitate to. Well, let, me, let me suggest this to you, brethren, that Luke 16 is ranked with or should be up with all those other great passages that we think about. Um, it's just very important. I said um, this morning, what, do, what does a rich man and, and, and what does a, a poor man in Luke chapter 16 have in common? Well, they receive different things after they die, but they both die. It's the one thing in all of Luke 16 that they share in common. It's the fact that they both die. What happened before they died is different. What happens after they died is different. The fact is these two individuals die. You know, the, the Bible is filled with um, all kinds of famous deaths. Uh, there's uh, Moses, there's uh, Abraham, there's Noah in the New Testament, there's, there's Stephen, and of course there's the crucifixion of Christ. Um, death is always presented to us throughout the scriptures. It's never hidden. It's never spoken about in hushed terms. And it can be a difficult topic, uh, and it can be a painful topic, but it presents this idea of death. The Bible presents it as being something that is very much a part of our life. And so all throughout the, the narratives of the Bible, you see this one teaching. It comes up uh, continually. Death, for the most part, um, brings about great emotion. And one thing that I've learned over the years is that people grieve in different ways. I have preached funerals where people were just, I mean, they were devastated. I've preached for funerals where the people were, were happy and excited for their loved one, and they, they saw this as being a good thing. I mean, I've seen probably all the spectrum that you can have, and we each process death in our own way. So, you know, I get the same thing about weddings. What, what's the right way to have a wedding? Well, however you want to have it, that's the right way. What's a right way for a funeral service? However you want it. So we process grief in different ways, and we express that grief in different ways. So what I'm saying is this. We don't all grieve the same way, okay? We don't all grieve the same way, but that's okay. Um, there are some passages that are known to us very well in Scripture, um, how death is viewed and the pain that comes from it. And you think of David and how he grieved publicly for his two sons um, after they, they died. There is the baby that's born to David and Bathsheba. 
And you remember the story. This is over in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 15. It says, And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore unto David, and he was very sick. This is the child born between David and Bathsheba. It says, David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted. And he went in and lay all night upon the earth. Kings don't lay on the ground, church. Kings don't lay on the ground. This is very important. And he laid upon the earth, and the elders of his house arose, and this is going to be their interpretation of him, and the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. That is grief. That is grief. David also mourns for another son. And you see this over in 2 Samuel chapter 18, and it's Absalom. David has been in a very bitter war. Absalom has rebelled against his father. And Absalom at the beginning, if you remember the story, has a lot of success. He is so successful that Absalom runs David out of Jerusalem. I mean, things are looking great for him, but the tide turns. Why? Because David is God's chosen man. And nobody on earth is going to set apart what God has chosen for David. So David is victorious. But before that process is realized, his son is killed. And when the news gets back to David, this is what he says in 2 Samuel chapter 18, beginning verse 33. It says, And the king, David, and the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God, have, would, would God I have died for thee? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Look what he's praying. This guy is, was out to get his head, and when he finds out he's dead, he's got grief. Oh, my son, I wish I would have died. I wish God would have granted me to die. Why? So I wouldn't have to go through this pain of grieving your death. Now, that's serious. And that's somebody who understands the full weight of somebody passing away. I know you understand that. I know we've all wrestled with the passing of a loved one. Okay? And the Bible is not foreign to that. The Bible speaks of these things. And it presents an understanding to us of what type of people, as Christians, how we can best view what happens after we die. Um, there are some moments in the New Testament where Jesus is involved in the death of an individual and he shows great compassion. Um, the first one that I think about is the lady at the city of Nain. Do you remember that? Uh, she was a widow and her son died. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 12. Now when Jesus came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Life's not going to be good for her. Life's going to be hard. Right? And as she and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. Compassion. Jesus knows there's life after death. Jesus knows and understands what the end result of the faithful is, but Jesus knows we hurt when we lose a loved one. Death brings with it a lot of emotions. One of those emotions is pain and loss and heartache. And Jesus recognized this. Let me tell you what he didn't do. He didn't rebuke the woman. He didn't encounter and say, why are you doing this? Why are you crying? You know, there's life after death. I mean, they're living under the Mosaical Covenant, and he's going to teach things that are going to happen, and he's going to bring about a different understanding in the, in the New Testament Covenant, in the New Testament. But he doesn't rebuke her. He doesn't say, why are you showing this emotion? He accepts where she's at in her grief, and he tries to comfort her. You know the end result. He raises her son from the dead. Um, this other familiar one is probably the most familiar one that we can think about, and that's in John chapter 11 where it talks about Lazarus' uh, death. And it says there in, in 11 and verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, his sister, uh, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. He saw the widow in the city of Nain, and it affected him. It affected him. He sees a friend that he has known, who's a good friend of his. He sees how his death has affected his loved ones, and it affects him. This idea that Jesus was a stoic man, that he didn't express any type of emotion, well, that's not true. 
He expresses motions, uh, emotion all throughout the New Testament in many different ways. It says this, he says these words, and he groaned in his spirit and was troubled and said, where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come see, verse 35, Jesus wept. Nothing wrong with expressing emotion. Nothing wrong with having that pain, right? Grieving for a loved one is not condemned. Now, why does all that matter? Because what we're going to see in Luke chapter 16 comes with some emotion, okay? What we're going to see in Luke chapter 16 from each of these different men, the rich man and, and Lazarus, uh, what we're going to see are two different reactions that clearly express emotion, okay? Emotion. Some of the denominational brethren um, kind of mess with this passage, and they present it as uh, Lazarus and Dives. Dives was the word for a rich man. And so it's kind of brought up this false understanding that this was this man's proper name. It wasn't. The Catholics have also read into this passage the, the um, idea of purgatory where you suffer for just a little bit and then eventually everybody goes to heaven. And none of those things are found in this passage. So we want to look at it fresh from what the scripture says. But I want us to notice a couple of things. Go over to Luke, Luke chapter 16, and we'll begin there in verse 19. Let me make a few points out for you. The first one is this. There is indeed life after death. Uh, notice, notice what is recorded for us. Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. It says these words. It says, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linens, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass, now notice this part, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and was Buried. Now, we're not going to go on yet. We're going to get verse 23 later. But notice that there's life after death. They go somewhere, right? It's not the doctrine that some would put forth in the world today called soul sleep, that when one dies, their soul rests with their body in the grave until the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's not true. That's not doctrinal. And that's not a doctrine that comes from Scripture. Oftentimes, death is presented in the Old Testament, uh, the majority of the time, as being um, like sleep. Like sleep and death is well because the person looks like they're asleep, but that doesn't mean that the person is not experiencing something. Okay, we just don't see it on the physical side of life, but they're experiencing something on the spiritual side of life. And so, this is what Jesus tells us at the beginning of this parable here's these two men, and both these men die. Okay, they both die, they both experience something. Um, I have Proverbs 14.1 on your outline there. That should be John 11 and verse 25 if you want to write that in. John 11 and verse 25. And I want you to notice what Jesus says to the woman. He says, uh, says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Jesus believed in life after death. Jesus presented to this woman that death is not it. You don't end at death. You go on. There's life after death. He who believes in me will liveth. That's life, isn't it? The rich man and Lazarus, they both die, and they're carried away to a place. They're alive. They're experiencing things. They understand things. That's the first one. When we talk about life after death, it exists. Here's the second thing. After death, there is sensation. There are things that are experienced. Um, go back to Luke chapter 16. Go down to verse 23. And it says these words, And in Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bo bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Isn't it interesting that he's tormented in, in death, and Lazarus was tormented in life? Did you make that connection? Lazarus experienced in life what this man is experiencing in death. There's a reason for that. There's a point that's being brought out. That's something that Jesus wants us to know and understand. 
their sensation. All your emotions and all your feelings don't end when one dies. Sensation goes with us into the grave because we experience things. We know things. And the big argument is, well, can you be certain? Well, I can be certain because I trust the words that Jesus is saying. I can be certain because Jesus is the one who came from heaven and the one who returned to heaven. I can be certain because Jesus has that knowledge and he has that understanding. And when he tells this story and he gives this example, he knows what he's talking about. And it's a reversal. It's a reversal. Look, and in Haiti, or excuse me, um, uh, and in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now the rich man's in pain. Now the rich man is, is experiencing things he does want to experience. There is this, this sensation. Look at Matthew chapter 13. And again, I'm cutting into the passage here. But notice what Jesus says. He's the one that's speaking. And he says this, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Two different reactions, two different experiences. The rich man and Lazarus, different. Jesus talking here, two people, different experiences. One experiences those things that are good, and another experiences those things that are bad. Their sensation. He doesn't say, oh, don't worry after you die. Nothing is going to happen. You're not going to feel anything. You're not going to know anything. Just go ahead and don't worry about it. That's called annihilationism. And brethren, it is a serious doctrinal error that is even in the Lord's church. This concept that when you die, you cease to exist. What is the eternal destruction? It means you're wiped out for eternity. That is not the doctrine of Jesus Christ. That is clearly not a doctrine that is found in the New Testament. You're not annihilated when you die. You remain to know that there's life after death, and you remain with sensation. Notice what Lazarus and the rich men are experiencing. It's sensation. Notice also the knowledge that goes with them, right? This man dies thousands of years after Abraham, yet in death, there's no posters of Abraham. There's no statues to Abraham. There's no drawings of Abraham. Yet in death, we are given a better understanding than we have in life. So this man, when he died, had the ability to look up and not only know Lazarus, the man at his gate, but he recognized Abraham. And he knew and understand who Abraham was. And certainly he believes now and definitely in the things that Abraham taught. But he has this knowledge. He has this sensation. He has this ability to reach out and to make an appeal. Please do something. Verse 24, have Lazarus dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am tormented in this flame. Sensation. So one second after death, you know that there's life. One second after death, you know that there's sensation. Here's the third thing. One second after death, you know there's a consequence. There's a consequence. Go back to Luke 16, beginning in verse 25. I want to go down to verse 26. It says these words, But Abraham said, Son, remember, uh, thou in thy lifetime receiveth the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Remember I told you the reversal? You've got to notice it from how they lived on earth, how they what happened in death. In verse 26, And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Your fate is fixed. I'll talk about that in, in, in the middle, I mean at the end, where there's no second chance. Their fate was fixed, and they're experiencing at that moment their consequence of how they lived. So the things that we do, the way that we act, that consequence doesn't stop when we die in the flesh. It continues when we're alive in the spirit. Okay? So nobody who has done evil or pain is dead and gone and doesn't experience that there's a consequence. We all experience that there's a consequence. Uh, Lazarus is experiencing something, and Abraham is experiencing something, and, and, or, and uh, the rich man, and Abraham is honest. He is honest with the rich man. He says, listen, Lazarus can't go there and you can't come here. 
God has fixed a gulf. God has said that in the Hadean realm, there's going to be a separation between righteousness and unrighteousness. And he fixes this gulf. What does it look like? I don't know. How wide and far is it? I don't know. But I know a spirit cannot cross it. A spirit cannot cross it. And so Abraham presents to him a, an understanding. He presents to him that there's a consequence. Uh, uh, Lazarus is here, and you're there. And the consequence, as he mentions, was when you were in life, you had the things you wanted, and Lazarus didn't. And it's not, and brother, and um, oh, he's married to Donna. Um, Leland, brother Leland brought out that good understanding last Wednesday where he said the penalty isn't, the consequence for this man isn't because he's rich. And the consequence for, for and the blessing that, that uh, Lazarus has isn't because he's poor. The consequence of the rich man is because he didn't use his wealth that was required under the law to help this poor man that's at his gate. It's one of unrighteousness. That's what it was. It wasn't his wealth. It wasn't his pocketbook. It was his unrighteousness. The same thing for Lazarus. Lazarus doesn't get a pass just because he's poor. Lazarus is one because he's in Abraham's bosom. We can glean from that. It's called a necessary inference because, Abraham, because Lazarus dies and he goes to Abraham's bosom. Lazarus must have been a faithful man. Faithful people go to Abraham's bosom. Unfaithful people go to Tartarus or they go to the flame. So we can infer from that, that that Lazarus was a man of faith, that he was a man who tried to live by faith. So we see that there's a consequence. Uh, Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. Um, Joshua's going to die. Um, Joshua was a mighty man of God. We named our son after Joshua. Joshua was a mighty man of God. Joshua conquered the promised land. Joshua did what Moses never did. He never got to go into the promised land. Joshua led the nation of Israel into the promised land, and he had 31 kings that bowed before him. He defeated 31 kings. He led the nation of Israel. He pushed them to be faithful. He drug them to be faithful. He encouraged them to be faithful. He did everything. He, he dealt with them going back and dealing with idols that were in the promised land or, or, or religions that were in the promised land. He had to keep pushing them. Go to God. Keep your focus on God. Well, in, in Joshua 24, he's going to die. So his reasoning is this. What can I do before I die? to help this nation that I've been leading, right? What, what final thing can I present to them to hope that they hold on to it, okay? And it's very simple. He tells the people the very thing that they've been do doing since they entered the promised land. He says, you know what? You've got a choice. You've got a choice. And he says there in Joshua 24 and verse 15, these words, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord... Choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what we're going to do. That's the decision that we have made. Now you decide. You decide how you're going to live. Why? Why? Because there's a consequence after death. There's a ramifications after we die. It doesn't matter that the flesh is gone. The spirit is very much alive and experiences those consequences. Right? Here's another one. Number four. One second after we die, we will remember and know that there is understanding after death. This idea that our mind is wiped clean. I, I don't know where it came from. I don't. I have no idea. This idea that, that our memory is taken from us, and, and usually the concept comes from a theological argument of where Revelation states that there'll be no sorrow, no pain, no mourning in heaven. So they say, see, God just wipes everything. It's like rebooting a computer. He just wipes everything out. Well, that's not true. That's not true. Our understanding is different, so there's no pain or sorrow or tears. Our understanding is greater, so there's no pain or sorrows or tears. Things are fully revealed to us, so there's no t uh, uh, pain, sorrow, and tears. All of those things are removed by God for his faithful, okay? But that doesn't negate the fact that there's understanding. There is understanding after death. Go back to Luke 16. Notice in verse 27 these words. 
It says, then he said, I pray, the rich man, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Some of your um, uh, translations there have Lazarus's name. That's fine. That's okay. It's not an addition. Some manuscripts add his name. Some manuscripts don't, but it's okay. Uh, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. He retained his memory. He knew who Lazarus was. He knew who he was. And he knew his family. I've got five brothers. And you know what? The things that I'm experiencing now, I don't want my brothers to experience. So here's what I ask. Send somebody. Send Lazarus. Let them give them a, a message. You know, let's get the word out there. I don't want people to come and to experience the things that I am, I am experiencing, you know? I, I want things to be better for them. I want, I, want what, I want them to have what Lazarus has. There he is in Abraham's bosom. Peace and comfort. Everything's good. Here I am in torment. I don't want my loved ones to come here. Isn't it the same belief that we have? We want good, good things for our loved ones, don't we? We believe in life after death. So we know that our loved ones, our friends, our family members... We, our co-workers, we know that when they die, there's life. And it is our desire, we push like Jacob and we, uh, Joshua, and we pull like Joshua, and we keep focusing everybody we know, trying to get them to realize who God is, what Christ has done, and the understanding that there are consequences after we die. And we do everything we can to prevent them from going to a place that we know is going to be, as, as the rich men say, I'm in agony in this flame. We don't want that for anyone. For no one. Um, the, the Lord's church cheat, uh, preaches the clear doctrine of hell. It preaches that hell is a consequence for the unfaithful, for those who are lost, those who were once enlightened by the gospel of Christ and who rejected and fell back into an unbelieving status. We know that it's real. We teach that hell is real. What we don't do is we don't preach. The only reason you need to be, be a faithful child of God is because of hell. We don't scare people with hell. We present the truth. You know what? There's a consequence for how you live. And the consequence is thus, right? It's not used to beat them over the head and to scare them and to terrify them and tell them all these stories and everything. It's just an honest approach. Let's see what Jesus said about life after death. Let's see what these two men experienced. I mean, these are things that we're going to experience. I want you to choose the better. I want you to choose the way of, of, of Lazarus. Isn't that what we do? So there's understanding after death. This man knows, he understands, he remembers, he's got a family, uh, he wants them to have good things, uh, wonderful things to take place, and there'll be understanding. Jesus talks about this as well. Jesus is talking about life after death here in, in uh, Luke chapter 16, and he talks about life after death in Luke chapter 23 and verse 42. Do you remember that? Two times he talks about life after death and says what's going to happen. Look at Luke 23 and verse 42. Uh, Jesus is being crucified. This is the thief on the cross. Okay, And um, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Now this man is not dying under the New Testament covenant. Jesus Christ had not died. He had not been buried, and he had not been resurrected. The New Testament is not in effect when Jesus is on the cross. The Old Testament is. And Jesus has already proven time and time again that he had the authority to forgive sins. He's going to forgive this man's sin, not under the New Testament, apart from baptism. He's going to forgive this man's sin under the Old Covenant, expressing his authority and his power over death. So it says this, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, right, you're going to die, my friend. You're not getting out of this. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Why in the world would Jesus turn to this man who is experiencing the horrific the crucif the, the crucifying <laughs> that Jesus is experiencing? Why would he turn to this man and say, you know what? Today you'll be with me in paradise. If there's not going to be any understanding, if we're not going to retain our memory, if we're not going to have knowledge, then why didn't Jesus turn and say, hey, friend, don't worry. In a minute you're going to be dead and you're not going to remember a single thing. Don't sweat it. There's a consequence. There's life after death. 
And Jesus tells them, listen, today you'll be with me in some place very specific. Paradisia is the Greek word there. Now let's notice this. It's not Uranus. Uranus is heaven. Jesus uses paradisia, okay? And what does he say later after his resurrection? Don't cleave to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Jesus didn't die and go to heaven. Jesus died and went to the Hadean realm. You see that in Luke chapter 16. A place of bliss, a gulf, and a place of torment. So he tells this thief on the cross, you're going to Hades. That's where you're going. Today you're going to be with me. I'm going to Hades. We know that's where Jesus went because, again, he hadn't ascended to the Father yet. And so he tells this to this man. I think it's going to be a comforting thing for him to say. Who wouldn't want to be in paradise? Who wouldn't want to be in paradisia? Who wouldn't want to be in a place of comfort? Think about it. This man is being crucified. His body hurts. He's embarrassed. His wounds are festering. He's scared to death. He's being mocked. He's thinking about all the things he did in life. He's regretting things he did in life. He's regretting things he didn't do in life. I mean, this man is in bad shape. Yet Jesus gives him hope and says, you're going to go to paradise today, my friend. And that's where you're going to be with me. So there is understanding. We retain our knowledge. The thief on the cross, Lazarus, and the rich man. The last one. Um, when we talk about one second after death, we know that there's going to be life. We know, secondly, there's going to be sensation. We know, thirdly, that there's going to be understanding, knowledge. And we know, fifthly, that there's not going to be a second chance. Now, let me, let me set this up. Um, so there, there are a lot of doctrines. I mentioned Catholicism, which teaches what's, what's called purgatory. And so what it is is there's hope that is laid out for people who are not faithful. And so the doctor goes like this. And they're not the only ones who teach this doctor, by the way. So the doctor goes like this. If you've been bad, you're going to have to be punished. Okay? You're, you're going to have to be punished. And if you're bad, God is going to send you to a place called um, um, purgatory. And they go over to Luke chapter 16, and they say, see, this is purgatory. No. No. That's not a temporary place that the rich man is in. It doesn't say that he's going to get a second chance. That's not recorded in there at all. So purgatory is not a doctrine that can be supported with book, chapter, and verse. It's a man-made doctrine. What? To give comfort to people who have rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Ah, oh, when you die, you'll get a second chance. No, you won't. No, you won't. Um, look at Luke chapter 16. Go down to verse 29. Verse 29. It says this. Abraham said unto him, uh, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. It's not going to work. There's not going to be this second chance, right? Right? Let me point something out, and it's easy to, to miss the, the context here, okay? So, so Abraham is telling this man, look, um, your, your family has the word of God. They have it. The, the writings of the prophets, they have the word of God. They have a chance to obey the word of God. You had a chance to obey the word of God. Anything that's happening to you now isn't because God willed it for you with no choice or chance. Everything that's happening now is because of the decisions you made, right? So they have the word of God. Let them obey it. And he says, no, 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 no. But if Lazarus goes, that's what he says, if one rise from the dead, they still won't believe. Many make that connection to be Christ. But notice what the man asked for. Send Lazarus. Send Lazarus. And in the immediate context, he says, oh, they're not going to believe even if one rises from the dead. You want Lazarus to come back? You want Lazarus to go to them and say, listen, your brother gave me a message. You don't want to go where he's going. Okay? Nothing can be done. Nothing can be changed. Go back, and I, I put this on your last point there. I put verse 26 again. Go back and look at verse 26. He says this, and beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. 
You don't get a second chance to go to paradise if you're in Tartarus. You don't get a second chance to go from the flame to bliss. There is no second chance after death. Your fate is fixed. Everything that the New Testament teaches is to be ready for death because that's the end zone. That's where it ends. You can't make another choice after you die. Everything that you are going to experience, whether it's punishment or reward, all of that comes to the moment of your death, and you can't change it, and I can't change it, and we can't change it for our loved ones. It's set. It's fixed. Now, does that hurt? It hurts me. It hurts me knowing that my loved ones won't get a second chance. Hurts me knowing that, that people that are close and dear to me don't get a second chance. But listen, you and I haven't been given the authority to rewrite the word of God. We have to obey the word that's written and revealed to us. And what does it say? There's a gulf. God has made a separation between a place of bliss and a place of torment. And Abraham is honest with him. Doesn't beat around the bush. Doesn't try to make him feel better. He says, look, you don't go here and we don't go there. It's the way it is. Your, your fate is is fixed. Right now, everybody who has died from Adam and Eve to this very second, to this very second, to this very second is in the Hadean world. Okay? They're not in heaven. I know we talk about, oh, he died and he went to heaven. They're not in heaven. They're not in Uranus. They are in Hades. Uh, they are in the Hadean realm. The Hadean realm, as we've seen right here, has a place called Paradise, Abraham's bosom, a place called Tartarus, and they're divided. Okay? They're divided. Right now, the Hadean world is being populated every time a person dies. Okay? That's called individual eschatology. Okay? Individual eschatology, eschatology is a study of end times. What happens? Okay? We're in the end times. There's not going to be another dispensation, right? This is it. The patriarchal, the mosaical, and the Christian dispensation. That's it. No other time periods, okay? So we're in the end times. How long are the end times going to last? I don't know. You don't know. We don't know when Christ is coming back, okay? So what we see is that under this dispensation, under this time, under what people are experiencing now, that when they die, they go to the Hadean realm. And that's where they remain until the second coming of Jesus Christ, right? That's where they remain until the judgment is given. Here's the rebuttal I always get from Luke chapter 16, beginning there in verse 29 and 31. Here's the rebuttal I always get from everybody. Because they don't, you know, they're like us. We don't want to think that loved ones are suffering or they're going to be, you know, in pain or whatever. Here's the rebuttal I always get. But maybe. But maybe. But maybe God will change his mind. He didn't change his mind for Lazarus, uh, for, uh, Lazarus, place of bliss. He didn't change his mind for the rich man in a place of torment. There's no but maybe. It doesn't exist. Uh, let me give you another example of that. Matthew chapter 25, you, you know the story here about the virgins and the lamps. But, but notice what it says. Uh, 25 verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. All right? And five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. Why? It says this, They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Why? While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, all of them, Right? And they trimmed their lamps. Uh-oh. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. 
You have to be prepared. Death is the finish line. It's the, uh, I mean, uh, death is the end zone. It's where everything stops that you have done. Everything. Individual eschatology. From the moment Adam and Eve died to this very moment, that's where you are. You're in the Hadean realm. General eschatology. Where everybody will go from the moment of the second coming for eternity. Biggest problem in scripture is people get those two eschatological facts mixed up. Okay? They confuse general eschatology with individual eschatology, right? The rich man and Lazarus are in individual eschatology. That's where they are to this very day. That rich man is there in torment and flame. He's still there. He'll always be there to the second coming, right? So there's always that thing. Well, you know, are you sure there's people that are suffering? Yeah, because I read Luke chapter 16. And I take it to be true. So what we're doing is we're living for both types of eschatology, okay? We're living for individual if we pass away before Christ returns, but we're also living for general, where we're all going to be if we're fortunate and Jesus is, uh, returns and we're alive, then we get ushered into general eschatology, okay? Well, that would be great. But both require a preparation, right? And both are given the understanding that at death, you don't get a second chance. Hebrews 9 and verse 27. Listen to how complete this is. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. But maybe, but maybe that this judgment, God will change his mind. But just, just maybe. It. It doesn't work that way. And so people will say, well, then, then the final judgment's already occurred. No, it hasn't. Well, you said you either go to Abraham's bosom or you go to a place at Tatarus when you die and you're conscious and you have understanding and you know the consequences. Well, obviously the judgment's been made. Not the final judgment. Look throughout the scriptures. Judgments are always made. God gives, gives many, many judgments upon the nation of Israel. Many judgments. What you see in Luke chapter 16 is not the final judgment. It is a judgment that is taking place in the Hadean realm. It is not a judgment that is taking place in heaven, Uranus, or hell, Gehenna. Right? That judgment hasn't been made. What do we know? Well, we know based on the separation, we get a real good idea what's going to happen. Right? You can't change your lot. You don't go from, from, from agony into bliss. It doesn't happen that way. It never changes. How do you know you're so sure about that? Because I understand what it means to have a great gulf fixed. I get it. I understand it. It's a separation put there by God. So the understanding is there's not going to be a second chance to change your position. It's fixed. Now, that scares me to a certain extent. It worries me. And let me tell you why. Because Jesus has so clearly, and, and listen, I, you know, we all read the, we all read the scriptures in a, in a, a different way. And, you know, punctuation, uh, how punctuation works is really simple. In, in the Greek, there are endings that are given to Greek words that indicate what the punctuation would be. They just didn't go through and randomly decide, let's put an exclamation point, let's put a period here. Uh, the end of that word indicates what the emphasis is on it. So we have punctuation. You know the original Greek didn't have that, just one line after another, one line after another, okay? So the punctuation does help. It does contain, help us contain what the thought might be. But the, the, the understanding always remains that when we look at the scriptures and we see the things that are taking place and we understand that there are consequences, there are going to be some exclamation points in our lives. And there are going to be some periods in our lives. But once we die, there's no question marks. None whatsoever. That opportunity, that time period, it's gone and our fate is fixed. That scares me because I know what the eternal destiny is of the lost and the saved. I know what it is. And brethren, listen, I know you know what it is. We all know. But here's the hard thing. We keep falling back into sin. And we know what the consequences are of sin. We know what the end result is going to be. If it is unrepented, unconfessed, undealt with sin. We know what the ram... I, you know what happened to the rich man. Jesus is talking about it. You know what happened to the thief on the cross. Jesus is talking about it. We know it. 
but we still struggle in our faithfulness. And we know it. If somebody came up to you and said, listen, um, the, uh, the 100 yard dash at the Olympics, listen, I know for a fact, I know for a fact that runner number five is going to win. I know it, I know it for a fact he's going to win. It's, listen, listen, trust me, I'm positive. Listen to me, listen, listen, get ready. Number five is going to win. Well, I like the shoes that number one is wearing. And so I'm going to go with the shoes. No, 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 listen to me. Listen, listen to me. Five is going to, I'm going with the shoes. Why take the chance? What does Jesus say in Luke 16? Don't take the chance. Maybe. Don't take the chance. Maybe. We're not in, we're not in to gamble for our eternal state. We're not in that. Since there is not a second chance, it should shape how we live as a people of faith. I'm like Paul. The good that I know I should do, I'm not doing. The evil that I don't want to do, there I am. Isn't that man's great wrestle? Isn't that man's great point where he confronts head on his mortality and his eternity? That great struggle that takes place. I mean, I'm good and I'm bad and I'm good and I'm bad. And I'm wrestling back and forth with all these things. And we strive to be a better people every day. We strive to be better Christians every day. We strive to be a people because we know what the end result is. I want to hear when I die because I understand that I'll be alive. I want to hear when Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 23, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here he is, the Christ, believe, uh, that's not the right one, Matthew 7 and verse 23, Matthew 7 and verse 23, and then I will profess unto them, this is at the end, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear it. All the things that I know I'm uh, uh, uncertain of in this life. I don't know what's going to happen five minutes from now. I have no idea. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I got zero idea. But I do know what's going to happen when I die. And you know what's going to happen when you die. So ought we to be prepared? Because the truth of the matter is, that is going to be saying, away from me. I never knew you. Or what about the reverse of it? Huh? Enter in my good and faithful service. Which one do you want? Well, here's the thing. The way you're living today right now is going to determine what you're going to hear. Either in or in or away from me. And I don't know where you stand. And I know I'm the new guy here. Okay? But I do know this about the Blue Springs Church of Christ. We want everyone that we possibly come in contact with to be told on that great day, enter in good and faith. We are in the soul business. We are in the people business. We are in the helping people to get to heaven business. And I know that's at the very core of everything that we do as a congregation. Let's get people to heaven. Let's get them there. How we live will, will factor in a great deal to how we reach those around us. If we're being casual and careless with the understanding that eternity is going to be there, and we're that way with our friends and neighbors and family members, why would we ever think for a blessing to happen? Right? Every time I've talked about this, this, this story, not a parable, every time I have talked about it, every single time, people always say, yep, I'm, La I'm Lazarus. Nobody ever says, eh, I'm the rich man. We want heaven. We want peace. We want security. We want eternity with God, not eternity apart from God. But listen to me. I'll say it one more time. We're done. We're done. We're done. I'll say it one more time. How we live today is going to determine how we're going to live after we die. I know how I want to live. And I have a pretty good idea of how you want to live. Well, let's live for it. Huh? Let's live for it. Let's live to be a people of faithfulness that we know will go to the Hadean realm and be in place of bliss or will go at the second coming to heaven and be with God and Christ forever. Let's live that way. The choice is ours. Joshua said it. You choose this day. I don't choose for you. You don't choose for me. You choose this day whom you're going to serve. Brethren, 
who are we going to serve? Um, we're going to have our song of invitation. You've been very patient. I thank you so very much. We're going to have our song of invitation. If you have any prayer needs, if you have any um, uh, things that you need uh, help with or encouragement, if you need more study, um, you know, let us know. Um, if you're here and you're not a member of the Lord's church, there's only one church, brethren. There's only one church and you found it. You're here tonight. It's the Lord's church. It is the churches of Christ. And if you're not a member of the Lord's church, um, I always say you can be, but I, I, I need to really say you need to be. You need to be a member of the Lord's church. The plan of salvation is on the front of our bulletin. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized. If you haven't done that tonight, listen. Listen to me. We know what's going to happen after death. And if you're not in the Lord's church, you haven't chosen the right way. Why take that chance? Be saved. Be saved tonight. Let's stand as we sing.